relationship between water and energy and look at it from a systems uh, point of view. Um, and I want to start by talking about probably the, the worst environmental disaster in modern times, which is the Aral Sea in Central Asia. And as you may know the story, uh, uh, this is a, a satellite image of the Aral Sea in 1989. Uh, you can see lots of water here. And this is uh, the same uh, area in 2008, and the water is pretty much all gone. Um, needless to say, it has, uh, you know, from an environmental point of view, this is uh, no good uh, for the uh, ecosystems associated with this. But even the communities that were living uh, in the vicinity of this uh, of this uh, body of water have essentially had to go away or or you know have a significant decrease in their well-being. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the only example in the world of this type. Uh, there's a more recent example, which is uh, Lake uh, Urmia in Iran. Um, and the same thing is happening over there. Uh, basically, the lake is just uh, running out of water. And uh, you know, where is all this water going? Well, uh, most, of, most of it is being taken away uh, for uh, irrigation purposes, uh, for uh, basically human and industrial use. In the Aral Sea case, it was basically for growing cotton. Now, these are examples, you know, Aral Sea was the Soviet policies which were no good anyways, we all know that. Um, this is Iran, you know, far away, you know, doesn't really matter. So let's come closer to home. Lake Mead in Nevada, a little bit closer. And as uh, you, know, you can see here, this uh, white uh, uh, band here uh, is, the, is indicating the drop in the level of Lake Mead over the last, uh, you know, 75 odd years that it's been around. It was built in 1935. Uh, Hoover Dam was built in 1935. And what is happening is that due to a combination of factors, primarily a, a significant drought in that region, um, basically the water has been, the water level has been dropping over the years. Um, and if this water level continues to drop, uh, you know, there is a point beyond which it is not possible to generate electricity from this, it is not possible to supply the city of Las Vegas and many other cities that rely on water uh, from uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell uh, further uh, upstream. Um, it turns out that uh, the drought that is going on here uh, is the way things used to be in this area until about maybe a uh, thousand years ago maybe less than that ago. So all of the development and all of the habitation that has happened has happened during an unusually wet time. Maybe we're going back to the way things were. But now there are hundreds of thousands of people in that whole area, Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, Las Vegas, so on. They're all going to move to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of Ohio, this is Lake Erie. Uh, and you can uh, probably see this. This is June 2011. And here is another image of Lake Erie in October of 2011, and you can see the green color here. So the issue with water is not just about quantity, it is also about quality. Here in this region of the, of the world, we have plenty of water, right? There's so much snow outside. It's been a very wet winter, too. The, the challenge here is that of quality. This algae is, is basically coming in due to the runoff from <coughs> farms uh, and, and homes, uh, you know, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, uh, strong water overflows, etc., uh, that end up in the lake and cause uh, you know growth of this algae, which causes eutrophication and essentially dead zones, which which make the lake much less productive than it could be otherwise, causing you know lots of uh, loss economically and environmentally. <clears throat> so, turns out there are dead zones all over the world. You know, around pretty much every developed country, uh, wherever there is a, a, a population center. There are uh, eutrophic zones, dead zones, due to either fertilizer and pesticide runoff or due to human waste. <clears throat> so, consumption of water has also been increasing. This shows the trend, you know, since 1951 uh, 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 or 61, uh, 51, in fact, and you know, basically, the amount of water we consume has essentially doubled, more than doubled. Most of the water we consume is for irrigation. That's this big, you know, blue region over here. A little bit, you know, for livestock industry and households. Although those have also been increasing over the years. So you know, with, with these sorts of, of, of examples and these sorts of trends, you know, the obvious question is, well, what should we do? And as soon as you start thinking about you know, trying to address this water challenge, what you realize is that what John Muir said is exactly what is true in this case too. 
And John Muir apparently said that, and he has written this, is when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So you start thinking about water, and you realize very soon, very quickly, as I will show you in the next uh, few slides, water is connected with energy, with food, with materials, and so on. So you can't really solve the water problem by thinking about just water. You've got to start thinking about everything. You start thinking about everything, it requires this big picture, <laughs> systems point of view. And that is not something that, that people, you know, science and engineering has really focused on very, uh, you know, uh, uh, much over the last many decades. It is a field that has been developing more recently. So to give you examples of this, of this interconnection between everything, Food, it turns out, depends on water. And what I have here are numbers, which is not just the direct consumption of water, but even the indirect consumption of water. So for example, for making bread, uh, the number, this is a global average, it's an approximate number, uh, because it's a global average, uh, is around uh, you know, 1,600 liters per kilogram of bread, which is roughly one loaf if it is whole wheat bread. That's about one loaf. Okay, now 1,600 kilograms, is, uh, is, or liters rather, is not what is used in the kneading of the dough and all that obviously, but it includes the entire life cycle, including you know, the fact that uh, it's made from wheat and maybe oats and other things, they all need water. Uh, it also includes the emissions that may go into the water and uh, cause pollution, and that pollution, to dilute that pollution up to sort of acceptable levels, also needs water. So all of that is included. So this is basically a water footprint. Uh, uh, measure. And you can see, you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a cup of coffee, 132 liters for about one cup of coffee, okay, 125 milliliters. Beef is the one that is up there. It's probably the most water intensive uh, food product uh, that we have today. This is industrial uh, beef, obviously, uh, 15,000 liters uh, per kilogram. So this is in terms of the, you know, the effect of water on consumption, uh, effect of food on the consumption of water. But also in terms of the quality of water, food is a major contributor due to the runoff, you know, which results in the algal growth and so on, as I mentioned. Energy also depends on water. Look at non-renewable resources. Per gigajoule of electricity uh, or per gigajoule of coal, it needs 160 uh, liters of water. Crude oil needs about 1,000 liters of, of water per gigajoule. But non-renewables are actually the better ones. If you look at renewable resources, hydroelectric is 22,000 liters per gigajoule. Biofuel, 70,000 liters per liter. Okay, and this range is large. It's about 50,000 to 150,000 for biofuels. I'm just showing you a, a rough average number. Even solar thermal needs water. Okay, even solar photovoltaics needs water because those solar panels have to be clean, otherwise their efficiency goes down. So you put them in an area that is a desert, well, it doesn't have water. So it's a, it's a challenge. These energy sources also affect water quality through acidification and runoff. You know, fossil fuels, you burn them, leads to NOx formation. NOx comes down as acid rain, affects water quality. Runoff due to biomass and so on causes the algal problems, among others. So food depends on water, energy depends on water. Let's go the other direction. Water depends on energy. Simple water purification processes, just disinfection, needs 360 joules of energy per liter of water. Reverse osmosis, 2, 000, uh, about 3,000 liters. Desalination, 14,000 liters. Bottled water, 8 million joules per liter. Mm -hmm. And most of this energy for bottled water actually is in the manufacture of the bottle. Not the water, it's the bottle. And the transportation and everything else associated with that. In, in, a, in a country like, like the United States, where you know, even we flush with potable water, bottled water, I don't know, is silly in my opinion. Anyway, so solutions, what may be solutions here? Well, on the consumption side, yes, obviously we should use water more efficiently. And if you think of the Southwest, where they're suffering from this major drought, you know, basically they're recycling, they're reusing water. Orange County has a, a plan to reverse osmosis process that is recovering all the water and they're converting it into drinking water quality. But we have to consider direct and indirect use. The water footprint is essential. Otherwise, what we end up doing many times is we end up improving efficiency you know, in one part, but that really doesn't end up reducing water consumption. It will just increase water consumption somewhere else in the supply chain. And overall consumption may not as a result you know, go down. So looking at this big picture, the system's view is essential. And that's what these concepts such as water footprint are capable of, uh, of, 
of uh, providing. So on the consumption side, there is a lot of effort going on. You know, I was in Las Vegas over the Christmas break uh, and the Grand Canyon area, and over there, you know, even all, you know, there they have signs there that this water is not portable because it is recovered. You know, so you know that's what is starting to happen now uh, over there. Still, plenty of lawns and golf courses. Um, on the production side, we can enhance the availability of good quality fresh water. I mean, the amount of fresh water on the planet is finite; it cycles. Okay. Desalination is an option to create new fresh water, but needs a huge amount of energy. Okay, so that's not something that is done, uh, you know, uh, except in some niche areas where there is plenty of energy available, uh, such as in the Middle East. But things that we could do on the production side are things like harvesting rainwater, reducing runoff. You know, a simple thing like having, uh, you know, the way we use land rather than having paved areas, having natural areas makes a huge difference in terms of reducing runoff and recharging uh, the aquifers. Restoring wetlands can play also a very crucial role. You know, 98% of the wetlands in Ohio are gone. And if you look at it uh, in the whole country, the number is probably around 90, it's 90 plus percent, okay? Restoring wetlands, you know, I mean, wetlands play a really important role in terms of purifying the water um, and uh, uh, making it available, you know, for human use as well as uh, for ecological purposes and so on. They're also aesthetically uh, appealing areas. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this is another area. The other thing that you know, maybe all of us could do, at least those of us who have a lawn or a, or a backyard or whatever, is get rid of that lawn, at least partially, talk to your neighbors maybe, uh, and replace it with native vegetation. Makes a huge difference in, in, the, uh, in the amount of uh, fresh water that gets down into the aquifers uh, over here. Okay? But you know, this, is, this is a challenge. I mean, all of these are, are challenges. Uh, you know, but if we are able to do any of these things, the benefits because there is the technical side. And to give you an example of that, I want to talk about this paradox: diamonds versus water. Diamonds are highly valued in terms of life, right? But they are kind of unnecessary. Nobody is going to die because of not having a diamond. They are totally non-essential, right? But we pay a lot of money for them. Water, on the other hand, has very little value in monetary terms. It's underpriced virtually everywhere. It's treated to be free. But it's essential for life. So, you know, these social, political, and cultural challenges are associated with these sorts of, this sort of a paradox are essential to address. Um, hopefully, we will address them before we really start valuing water when it runs out or is close to running out. So I'm hoping for a future that's more like this than an alternate picture that I could have put in there that would be a lot more impressive. <laughs> so I'm going to stop over there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So when you say disinfection, uh, 360 joules per liter, I'm just wondering what the, are you assuming they're doing to do that? Is it UV or exposure? Is it something else? What? Right, so the number that I, uh, the, most of the numbers I showed you, you know, it is a range. There are many different ways of doing each of those things, right? So right. there is a range of numbers. Uh, what, I, what I showed is sort of an average number. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's sort of an average of, uh, uh, you know, various disinfection methods, uh, antibacterial sorts of methods, including a, a, a use of chemicals, uh, ultraviolet light, you know, a few other options. I've sort of provided an average number. If you want the details, uh, the reference is there at the bottom of that slide. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a paper by Peter uh, Glick, uh, uh -huh. you know, that came out in 2009, and I, I would be happy to send okay. it to you. Well, I asked you for the PowerPoint. Yeah, right, right. Oh, great. Thank yeah, you. but even the paper, if you can't access it or whatever, you know, I don't have a lot of details there. I can, you know, send it. Yeah, I can get it from the library. Thank you. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. So how do you increase the value of water? Do we charge more, more money for water? And then the, you know, the supply stays the same and people just use less because the cost of water. Right. So why doesn't that happen? Right. Well, great questions. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, um, I, I'll try to answer the first, the second question first. I mean, why has that, why has that not happened? <coughs> You know, it's, oh, at least for the last uh, five, six hundred years, uh, the way that we have done things uh, is based on ignoring nature. Think of any academic discipline except ecology. Every academic discipline ignores nature, takes it for granted. In engineering, there is the assumption of a, of a 
uh, of an infinite sink. Okay, there is the assumption of a reference state in thermodynamics, which is assumed to be the same. But the reference state has changed today as compared to what it was even 50 years ago. Right? So you look at economics. Economics ignores nature until quite recently. It treats nature as being outside the market. You look at, uh, you know, pick any discipline. There is this inherent tendency to take nature for granted. So as we have become more prosperous, our knowledge of nature has kept on decreasing. So we, we take nature for granted even more. We live in climate controlled surroundings, we have no idea what's going on outside and we don't even care. What does it matter? You know, so so I think I mean that is one of the many reasons. But to a large extent, I think what has been happening uh, or what the root cause of a lot of the challenges we face is the disconnect between what we really need to sustain ourselves and you know our knowledge of that. Okay, all right, what is to be done? I mean, why is it not getting into the prices and so on? I mean, I guess it's the, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, you know, but increasing the cost of it is one way, but that, that has a disadvantage too, which is that, you know, people who, who are poorer, you know, water is a necessity. You, you can't get, have, you know, people who don't have the money, expect them to pay more for it. So that gets into sort of ethical, you know, moral sorts of issues, and, and in some parts of the world, there are efforts where you know governments are saying that up to so many thousand liters per month or whatever, the water will be available to everybody for free. Beyond that, so that is the minimum that everybody will need to survive. So then it doesn't matter whether you can pay for it or not. But beyond that, they are making it really expensive. That's an experiment that is being tried out in a few parts of the world. Which never know of. You know, but there is need for more innovation. Yeah. No, no. So people have begun, starting about 10 or 15 years ago, to put some sort of value on ecosystem services. You right. said we ignored it, That's but right. it's not quite true. And it's not just ecologists, it's also physical scientists and engineers. So and I'm not sure, though, how you put a value on these things. I'm not, I don't do it myself. Right. So I'm, right. I'm thinking they probably would undervalue things rather than overvalue things if they're trying to come up with a number. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, you're right. There's a lot of work going on on trying to quantify the value of ecosystem services. And, you know, I have some research that also connects with that. Uh, you know, I don't put monetary value on things, but that is what people are, are doing now, are trying to do, you know. And then businesses are looking at, uh, you know, maybe using that information for their decisions and so on. And how do you value these things? I mean, you know, there is, uh, Elena Irwin is going to be talking later on, and she would be the right person to tell you the, all the economics principles, you know, that, that are relevant to that. But, you know, I mean, I think there is a big risk to those kinds of valuation methods. I mean, I, there is a benefit, obviously, that, you know, people then will not ignore it because everybody seems to understand one language that is, you know, in no. common and which is money. Mm. But the risk is that, you know, you can't, I mean, how can you value something that your life depends on? It's worth everything, right? Mm -hmm. So there is that that sort of a, a thing that, that makes me and a lot of people uncomfortable about putting monetary values. You know, if, if we decide that uh, the Amazon rainforest is worth a uh, hundred trillion dollars, there's some rich guy out there, you know, says, "Ah, oh, here's hundred trillion dollars, cut it all off." I mean, is that acceptable? So it, there are some fundamental issues there, but I think you know it is better to value it rather than ignoring it entirely. Okay, this is very much sort of something that is, you know, uh, evolving as we speak, and a lot of research is currently going on uh, in this area. Yeah. I just want to see if uh, your research um, ever went along the line of uh, water credit exchange, mm -hmm. um, a similar application to uh, carbon footprinting or yeah. carbon uh, yeah. credit exchange. Um, I know, in, in light of your, your ethical questions, uh, Carbon is also be, became, I would argue, a more of an ethical question as we really discovered what carbon meant to humans. Right. Although that may not have been on the forefront, um, I stepped in a little bit late. But given your uh, engineering background and your research, uh, could you comment more about water credit exchange uh, versus carbon credit? Well, I mean, so carbon credit. Uh, you know, I mean, the idea is basically the, uh, you uh, 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 trade. Uh, the emissions uh, permits, so to say, right? And for carbon being a global resource, there has to be a global market for it. 
there isn't, but you know, that's a whole other story, you know, protocol and all that. Uh, but for water credit exchange, I mean, yes, there are some efforts along those lines. In fact, the earliest effort uh, that I know of was uh, uh, the company Perrier in France, where they were bottling water. And what they were realizing is that the nitrate content of the water that they were you know, bottling at source was increasing because of the farming practices of cheap. So they paid the farmers to change their, their practices. You know, those practices, you know, to change them would have been expensive. So Perrier paid the farmers and the farmers changed their practices. So that way, you know, that is in, in modern times, uh, you know, and, uh, one of the earliest examples of this kind of an exchange. So now those sorts of things uh, have been set up in some parts of the world. As far as I know, it isn't particularly uh, common yet, uh, but there is an effort going on to actually go even beyond water uh, trading, to go into ecosystem services trading. So, for example, if you have if you have, if you have a tree in your backyard, you know, it's providing all kinds of services. Uh, you benefit from it, but society also benefits from it. So, people are thinking about well, how do we, you know establish some kind of a training mechanism mm -hmm. that will take into account not just the, the water aspects of it and the carbon sequestration, but also pollination services, you know, uh, biodiversity, etc., etc. So that is something that, again, you know, from an economics point of view, you know, a market point of view, maybe that is the thing that is ultimately needed. Mm -hmm. The obstacles for getting there are formidable. Because you know some people will win, some people will lose, and you know it's going to be get into the usual political you know cat fight that that cannot be avoided. It seems, but that seems to be the right direction to go in. Well, thank you so much, Bob. That was most interesting. Let's give him a